special speaker here today, 29 years in the making, <laughs> Pastor Peter Leo. All right. How's everyone doing tonight? All right. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so what do we think? Do we believe Brady and Belichick? Or? Yeah. Yeah? We do? All right. <laughs> That's right. They, they weren't aware. Maybe they misremembered wh whether the balls were inflated properly or not. <laughs> I've, I've heard that sentence before. Have you ever heard that? From politicians? In instead of admitting they're wrong? Oh, I misremembered. I remembered incorrectly. Oh, man. They try. They try. Okay, so if you would turn with me, we're going to begin in Matthew chapter 10 and starting in verse 32. Now, all this week I've been feeling a big-time challenge to, to press into the Lord as never before. And I hope... I hope my passion comes, comes through here as, as I'm feeling it in my, in my heart and in my spirit. Okay, so Matthew 10, starting in verse 32. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father, who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father, who is in heaven. Now here's where it gets really rough. In verse 34, do not think, this is, this is uh, Christ speaking, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. Ouch. Th verse 37, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, meaning under your, under your own seeking, your own power. But he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Let's pray as we begin tonight. Father God, we come before you with thanksgiving. Lord God, we just ask right now that your spirit will be with us, Lord God, that you would um, that you would open up a revelation of your word tonight. Lord God, I pray that we would be encouraged, that we would be challenged tonight, that we would not leave the same way that we came in here. Lord, I pray that your, that your spirit would, um, would bring to light whatever it is, Lord, that you, that you want us to work on to get, to get out, uh, to move past tonight so that we could serve you with less uh, intrusions, with less interruptions, Lord God, and with less, um, with less striving. Lord God, I thank you so much for your, um, for your presence in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. That's a, a real startling passage, wouldn't you say? That here, here we have Jesus saying, I came to divide households. Now, how can this be when, when we, we see other verses in Scripture saying, God is love, and we're commanded to forgive as much as someone offends us, we're commanded to forgive them instantly and try to, um, and try to move past that and not keep a record of their offenses against us but continually forgive, even, even when they continually harass us and continually offend us, whatever it may be. How can it be that, that a God like that, who is a, a just and righteous judge, one who will never leave us or forsake us, how is it that he could be the very one that says, I'm going to divide households against each other? And here's what I feel the answer is. Let me just read you this, this part here. I feel a fire burning in my heart tonight to challenge you and to challenge me also. We are facing trying times, dangerous times, desperate times. And as the saying goes, desperate times call for desperate measures. And the Lord can use desperate people. And, and I think that, that that's the key to understanding this passage in Matthew 10. And, there, and also it's, it's said, um, I, I love the way that it's said in Luke, um, it's chapter... 
Luke 12, and starting in verse 49, it's, it's the same, uh, this same little uh, account here. And what it says is just a little bit different. Here it says that the Lord has, has sent a fire to us, and how I wish it was kindled already, meaning he wants to stir things up. He wants to shake things up and heat things up. And I know in my life, so oftentimes, I can so easily become so comfortable with the way life is. I get a handle on how things are going. I, I think I've got things figured out. And it's in those places that I begin to slack off in my relationship with God. It's in those places that I stop spending as much time with Him as I need to. It's in those places that I, that I stop pressing in like I need to. And then surprise, surprise, a few months down the road, I need a breakthrough and I'm spiritually unequipped to get it. How many of you in here are, are praying and reaching up for breakthrough tonight? Whether it be in finances, whether it be in your physical health, whether it be uh, uh, interceding for a family member, a close friend, someone who's going through an extremely difficult time, an illness, some kind of uh, affliction, whatever it is. Tonight, sometimes the answer is that the, we need to let the Lord shake things up so that we remember just how vital it is that we continue to press forward in Him. And we continue, just as that, I love the song we sang tonight we close with, is that we continually seek to draw closer to Him so that we are further and further away from our way we think we need to do things. Because even in, even in my 29 years, I have seen you know, much heartache and, and much confusion come to me because of choices that I have made or when I went out and tried to seek to do something instead of listening to wise counsel, either of my spiritual headship, the pastors here, and, and obviously from the scriptures first and foremost. So tonight I want to put a call out to you, and, and this is also for me. For those of you who feel a tugging on your heart tonight to press in deeper and deeper into the presence and power of the Lord and to allow yourself tonight, starting right now, to be taken further away from the safety of the shore of convenience, complacency, meaning being okay with where you're at, not seeing a need to, to go forward, and compromise. I'm putting a call out tonight for all those of you who would say, tonight I want to make a, a, a stand in my spirit. I want to chase after the Lord with, with everything I have and burn the ship, so to speak, so that there's no retreat, there's no surrender, and to push all in with the Lord staking you. Is anyone here make, want to make that claim with me tonight? Amen. Amen. Now, it, it, I love the way that Luke phrases this, this passage here because he talks about the importance of the fire. And w what are some things that, that fire does? Fire illuminates, all right? It gives off light as well as heat. But now, if you, if you lit a, even a small, just think of the smallest fire that you could possibly lit, even let's say a lighter. If I, were, if I were to go out with a friend and, and we were in a, a pitch black field that had no, no lights around, let's say we went to a park or something with no lights around it, and I told him to just run as fast as he could for 10 straight seconds in the opposite direction and then stop at 10 and, and do an about face and, and look back in my direction again, and I held up a lighter, no matter how far away he was, he would see even that one little light, even though all around it is black as black could be. And that's how light is. Thank the Lord. Light is, is, number one, the ultimate disinfectant, right? <laughs> when, you, when you put things in the light, it forces you to deal with them. When you, when you put things out there to the Lord, when you admit, confess your sins, to, obviously to the Lord, but then also to people around you so that they can pray with you and lift you up and come alongside you and help you through whatever you're going through. Um, it's it's in, in those times that we see that light obviously can disinfect, but, but it also uh, chases away the darkness. Darkness and light cannot coexist in the same spot. When darkness is creeping in, that means there's an absence of that light or the light is being allowed to be pushed back or pressed down a little bit. So, so it's up to us to find out, okay, what, where am I slacking? What's going on here? Why is the Lord allowing this to me? And seeking him for it with honest questioning. Be real with the Lord when you pray. If you're, if you're going through something and you can't get that breakthrough, just have a conversation with him. Seek him uh, in spirit and in truth. Has anyone here uh, heard of uh, Francis Chan? He's a pretty well-known now um, Christian author and, and minister. He said, 
We never grow closer to God when we just live life. It takes deliberate pursuit and attentiveness. We have to realize, we have, excuse me, we have to believe it, meaning the word, enough that it changes how we live. Those are, that's, that's about as straightforward as you can get. You know, uh, all growing up, I used to hear this, this question asked of us all the time. If you were ever put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? If, if you asked your coworkers, if you asked your family members, you know, what, is, what does this person believe? If they don't know, then the Bible says you're, you're in trouble because then technically you would, you would be falling under... Um, partially of Matthew 10, 32. If you deny me before men, I'll have to deny you before the Father. And, and we, we can't be quiet. We can't be quiet. The Bible promises us, however, that the Holy Spirit will bring us opportunities to witness and to share our faith. And also, thankfully, that the Holy Spirit will show us in those times what to say if we're in tune with Him and our spirit is, is, um, is tuned up to Him, to His note, what, what He's playing. Um, but... At the same time, we have to be seeking those out. And at the very least, at the very least, you can find a way to work, to work in something. If you, if, you know, if you have a friend who's going through a really uh, tough problem, you know, just ask them, can I pray for you? Even if they're not a believer, can I pray for you? Something as simple as that. If they think that that's shoving your faith down their throat, then too bad. I mean, the, the worst that can happen to you is you'll get better because I'm praying for you, right? Right. <laughs> Or, well, technically the worst that could happen is that, is that they don't get better. However, they're not any worse off for you having prayed. But, but now they'll have the Lord even more on their side because there's someone in their corner again, right? All right. So living for Christ, our Savior, has to be more than a hobby. It has to be viewed and walked out, listen to this, as a relentless pursuit. We have to live life, a life that is unmistakably pointing up to heaven and leaving uh, leaving all who are in our spheres of influence better than when we found them. The most important thing to remember in all of this is that the Lord is our justice, the Lord is our covering, and the Lord is our vengeance. So many times I go through situations and I want to be heard, I want to be understood. Someone, uh, someone misinterprets you know, s- something I say or, or do or... Um, I'm, you know, I'm slighted in some way or I'm offended in some way, and it's and not up to us to, um, to try to rectify that problem. It's not up to us to worry about our reputation with other people. The only thing that we are to worry about is our character. All right, there's, there's a, a leadership quote that goes like this. Uh, reputation is theirs, but character is yours. The only, thing you can worry, uh, the only thing we can worry about or control is what we do and how we respond to things. People think whatever they want to think, but we have to trust that the Lord is the one who is going to justify us, that the Lord is going to be the one to bring us through whatever we're going through tonight. So tonight I want, um, I want to say, do not let your faith waste away when you feel, even if you're at the end of your rope tonight, whatever's going on in your life. I love this quote here by a British pastor from the 1800s whose name was William Tip Taft. He said, the rougher the file... Listen to this. If God's bringing you through a trial, the rougher the file, the less the rust. So the harder it is, if you stand strong and you walk through it with the Lord, when you come out on the other side, you'll be that much better for it. You'll have that much more perseverance built up in you. You'll have that much more spiritual strength built up in you. And the more faith that you can operate in, uh, my father always, always said growing up in, a, in his sermons that faith is the currency of heaven. By the amount of our faith, that's um, the size of the miracles that can come our way. Hallelujah. So, so tonight I want to tell you a story of a man who experienced extraordinary personal and social upheaval, but stood strong, leaving us a legacy to follow. A man who ceaselessly pointed the world around him to heaven and to the one true God. Some of you may have heard of this man. I've been reading his story, and it's just incredibly powerful. Tonight, I want to take you back to Germany in the year 1930. A young minister here looks around him and begins to see the country that he grew up in and loved, now turning away from the Lord and turning to every kind of perverse doctrine, every kind of um, false doctrine, and turning towards a heretical patriotism under the rule of its Fuhrer, Adolf Hitler. In Hitler's worldview, Christianity was but fairy tale mysticism and had no place in Germany. 
and it was only weakening the Aryan race, as he would say, and holding back the progress of their society. This young minister here is growing increasingly concerned for the church in Germany and for its people who are being brainwashed by the thousands and becoming agents of the Third Reich, turning on each other, even their family members, when their thoughts dissented from the National Socialist demanded viewpoints and ideologies. Tonight I want to tell you about a man who never gave up on the gospel, even through the roughest of circumstances that you can imagine. Never gave up on God's people and never lost heart. Never gave in, even though all around him seemed lost. He decided to continue to stoke the fires of his heart for the Lord. He pressed in like never before and has left a more than heroic legacy for us to be inspired by. This man's name is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. A group called the German Christians slipped into bed with Hitler and the Nazi movement and helped pave the way for the social and cultural transition by prostituting the gospel to fit, to fit what Hitler and his thought that it should say. This helped the Christian population in Germany to become deceived by a false gospel and to be overtaken by a great principality, which would be a demon that's over a, a region or even a false religion or anything like that. That would be a principality. And we can see here that through, partly through fear, partly through um, not having a spirit that's really in tune with the Lord for trying to use this instead of their spirit and connecting with the Lord, they started falling prey to, uh, to bowing to Hitler and, and giving in to his demands and changing the gospel, changing this to fit what they thought it should be, which should never be. As early as 1929, I want, you, I want you to hear this. As early as 1929, Hitler started making public calls to rid society, listen to this, of the disabled, of the mentally handicapped, and those who could not contribute to society. They needed to be weeded out because they were viewed as simply drains on the country's resources so a more perfect German could be raised up in the following generations. Listen to this quote that Hitler, this is what Hitler said about Christianity. It has been our misfortune to have the wrong religion. Why didn't we have the religion of the Japanese who regard sacrifice for the fatherland as the highest good? Or the Mohammedan religion? This too would have been much more compatible to us than Christianity, meaning to him. <laughs> Why did it have to be Christianity? Listen to this, with its meekness and flabbiness. See, in his mind, he was God. I am the kingmaker. I am the one who makes things happen. Not this, not this guy who talks about grace and forgiveness and letting, letting people just drain you of everything that, that you have and continually forgiving them and, let, and bringing them in and trying to restore them. Why bother with that? If they don't want to help themselves, why should I bother to help them? In some sick, twisted way, some of those, some of those points you could be like, oh, you could pause for a second, and then you're just like, wait, what? Yeah. Now, for, through this, Bonhoeffer could not sit idly by. He started with his sermons, because he pastored over many churches, making sure that the people of God under his covering, covering received accurate, untainted instruction in spite of what other Christian groups in Germany allowed themselves to fall to. In 1939, German doctors, listen to this, were ordered to register every German child that was born with a genetic defect and they were to be euthanized just for being born with a defect. They were to be euthanized so that they did not waste the Reich's money and hinder progress towards the perfect master race. What a stark difference this is to the command of Christ for us to care for the less fortunate, to help the sick and the dying and to pray for them, to help the poor, the orphans, the widowed and the broken. The Bible says that he is a father to the fatherless. And he puts the solitary in families. That's our God. <clears throat> we are not to view these kinds of people as resource drains. When we take care of these people, we stand for them. We are standing for Christ and taking care of him and those who are close to his heart. Bonhoeffer saw in the 1930s a group who called themselves the German Christians arise. They perverted scripture in every way imaginable, in order to, listen to this, to demean the Jews, specifically, they tried to use scripture to demean the Jews, to corrupt Jesus' life 
an image. They, they actually ended up trying to tell their congregations that Jesus was actually the ultimate anti-Semite. And they began to take further and uh, to turn the hearts of the German people further and further away from the Lord and to a Jesus whose grace was seen as weak and that Hitler should have been an authority over it. In June 1939, Bonhoeffer went to America to work, seeing where Germany had fallen to. But after only, listen to this, after only 26 days in America, Dietrich Bonhoeffer knew that he could not let his countrymen suffer and God's people, and also the Jews in, in Germany suffer while he was living free. He just couldn't reconcile that. So you know what he did? He knew he had to do something. So he returned to Berlin. After pastoring over two churches near the, the border of Poland for a few weeks, on August 26th, Bonhoeffer returned to Berlin for good. By this time, biblical Christianity and its ministers were all but considered criminals in the eyes of the National Socialists. On July 14, 1940, the Gestapo broke up a church conference where Bonhoeffer was speaking in Konigsberg, and they said it was because of a new order that was to ban meetings like this, and they ordered everyone to leave immediately. Of course, not, you know, with no due process or anything, it's just, well, this is the new law, so no more conferences, no more ministering, you're done. Everyone had to leave that instant. And it was, it was at this time that Bonhoeffer was invited by his brother-in-law, whose name was Hans, I'm not going to try to pronounce his last name, it's tough, <laughs> to join the Abwehr, which, is, which was a German military intelligence organization. Now through this, he was able to return to being a pastor of a church because it was, it was his, his cover. But he was a German military intelligence officer, you know, behind the scenes, you know, as, as far as everyone in the uh, German legislation was concerned. And, during, during, uh, and also through this, he was able to be a pastor, to preach, to help the Jews that were trapped in Germany, because he did that during this time. And he also became exempt from combat duty, which helped a lot, because that, that saved him from one harsh stand that he, had to, <laughs> that he would have had to take otherwise. During the time following, Dietrich had fallen in love with a lady named Maria, and they be, became engaged to be married. During this time, Maria proposed that they not have contact for six months. Not sure why. I, I, I didn't get an explanation, but she, she wanted to, to have that little time of separation, maybe to just try to grow as much as they could individually and then come back together after six months. So they decided while Dietrich was here and she was in another city to not write for six months. The months passed and he awaited his reunion with Maria and the following wedding with great anticipation. But on April 5th, 1943, Dietrich called the home of his brother-in-law and sister, and a strange voice answered the phone. It was here that Dietrich knew that the Gestapo had made their move, and he would be found next. He returned to his home after sharing what he knew was his last meal with his sister, Ursula, and was met by the Gestapo and loaded into a black Mercedes, and they, and they saw him for the last time. He was then imprisoned at Tegel Military Prison, which is the largest in Germany, and here he was for 16 months. From here, Dietrich was taken to Buchenwald Concentration Camp, which was one of the Nazi death centers. In this place, the soldiers were ordered to keep the prisoners only well enough for them to be interrogated. Scottish geologist Hugh Falconer said of Bonhoeffer, he was very happy during the whole time that I knew him. I want you to, I want you to listen to this and get, get this, guys. <clears throat> he was very happy, very happy during the whole time that I knew him. He did a great deal to keep some of the weaker brethren from depression and anxiety. He divided his time between instilling the foundations of Christianity and learning Russian, probably from the, other, from the communists that were imprisoned under the Nazi regime there. <clears throat> Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, Who stands fast? Only the man whose final standard is not his reason, his principles, his conscience, conscience his freedom, or his virtue, but who is ready to sacrifice all of this when he is called to be obedient 
and to act responsibly in faith and in exclusive allegiance to God. The responsible man who tries to make his whole life an answer to the question and call of God. So that is the man who can stand through the trials when he knows that he's doing it for his God, that he loves more than himself. After this, Bonhoeffer was transferred to the Flossenburg concentration camp in Bavaria, where after a short summary trial, he was executed by hanging as a traitor to the Third Reich and a spy. And the account of Bonhoeffer's death was captured like this from the, from the camp doctor. The camp doctor at Flossenburg was H. Fischer Hallstrung. He had no idea whom he was watching at the time, but years later he gave the following account of Bonhoeffer's last minutes alive. On the morning of that day, between 5 and 6 o'clock, the prisoners, among them Ad Admiral Canaris, General Oster, General Thomas, and Reichsgerstadt Sack, were taken from their cells, and the verdicts of the court-martial were read out to them. Through the half-open door in one room of the huts, I saw Pastor Bonhoeffer. He was known as the pastor, even in the, in the concentration camp. Before taking off his prison guard, kneeling on the floor, praying fervently, to his God. This was when his execution was imminent. And what did he do? He prayed. He did not lash out at his captors. He didn't try to escape at this point. He prayed. He trusted. I was most deeply moved by the way this lovable man prayed, so devout and so certain that God heard his prayer. At the place of execution, he again said a short prayer, and then climbed the steps to the gallows, brave and composed. His death ensued after a few seconds. In the almost 50 years that I've worked as a doctor, I have hardly ever seen a man die so entirely submissive to the will of God. Let it be said of us tonight that we were entirely submissive to the will of God. Is that you tonight in here? I am so challenged by this story. What an amazing testimony that his life was. And what a legacy that he has, he has left for us. So many times we, have, we, go through, we go through issues and conflicts and different things that, that keep us so bogged down and keep us so far away from what the Lord wants for us tonight. So I, I, I'm going to mention some things that we're going to call... Uh, as, as we get ready to close here, that we're going to call the wet blankets that will quench the fire in our hearts and our spirits for the Lord. An undisciplined devotional life. This is key to get a handle on. If, if you're in this room tonight and you, don't, if you, and you no longer consider yourself a new Christian and you're still struggling reading your Bible every day, then put more effort in and... and Make it so you're no longer struggling to do that. Even if it's just for a few minutes, if you really have a jam-packed schedule and you just can't do it, maybe you need to just go to bed a few minutes earlier the night before so that you're a little, a little fresher when, when the morning comes. Maybe it's, maybe it's um, you know, putting on a sermon while you're driving on your way to work. If you get up really early and you work very long hours, let's say, on your lunch break, take out your Bible and start reading. Take out an Our Daily Bread and start reading. And if someone comes up to you and asks you about it, talk to them about it. Take it as, a, as an opportunity for the Holy Spirit, that, that the Holy Spirit brought to you. If you get ridiculed for it, stand strong. Stand fast, like he did when he knew the gallows were waiting for him. What did he leave with? If you, in this, in this account here, uh, this book by Eric Metaxas, he says here that in, in the, the second to last concentration camp that he, was, that he was transferred to, he actually had one of the guards offer to help him escape. That's the kind of legacy that he left. That's the kind of reputation that he had. This guy knew, this, this guy's not a threat to the Reich. He, he hasn't done anything. And how many times in our lives do we feel like, I haven't done anything to deserve this, but we're going through one of the worst problems that we could ever have faced. I want to challenge you tonight, people of God, to stand strong because, you, because uh, sometimes the answer is to just press in more and you have to just wait until the Lord speaks.
because he's trying to bring something out in you. He's trying to perfect something in you. He's trying to grow something in you that wasn't yet there so that when you come through the storm, you'll be able to enjoy the sun on the other side that much more and you'll be able to encourage those around you and you'll be stronger for it. So an undisciplined devotional life will, will uh, rob you of your spiritual power very quickly. And I, and I love that. Thank you, Joe, for sharing that. Joshua 1.8, that was the verse I had attached to this one. Be strong. No, I'm sorry. Wait. <laughs> one nine. Sorry. I'm in one eight. Okay. One eight and nine, let's say. One eight and nine. Because <laughs> in one eight, it says, The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written into it. Don't we can't pick and choose, people of God, what what we listen to, what we believe. We have to believe it all or we believe none of it. Because if we believe part of it, don't be surprised when your prayers don't get answered. You don't get that breakthrough. The Lord doesn't speak to you. You don't, uh, you, you don't feel that um, his presence around you. Sometimes, sometimes we, need to, we need to find out what it is that we're not allowing ourselves to be given over to the Lord in. Sometimes we can try to resist the Lord and then we end up being like trees that are on a wind-blasted shore. Anybody ever seen pictures of those? Trees that are in some shores, like in a certain area where the wind is constantly coming from one direction, the trees will actually end up growing with the wind. So there'll be almost no branches on this side if the wind's coming from this direction. Almost no branches there. They'll have all been going like that. But as, as, as the saying goes, only, only dead fish swim with the current. <laughs> wow. So... <laughs> So an, another, another thing that, that, can, that can rob us of our spiritual power is success, prosperity in the, in the natural, having a, a comfortable lifestyle, a nice home, things are going well, all your, all your bills are paid, even promotion, if you get a you know, big, big promotion at work, sometimes when you move into that, that can, that can lead you to a false sense of security, uh, but little do you know at any moment company could go bankrupt, the stock could plummet, there goes your 401k, there goes your salary, even, even your job. And I would direct you to uh, Luke chapter 18, verses 18 through 27, the story of the rich young ruler. He tells Jesus, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, now that you've told me you have obeyed all of the commandments, sell all of your possessions, Give them to the poor, and then you will enter the kingdom of heaven. Because Jesus knew, he knew that, the, that you know, even though he had followed all of, the, all of the Ten Commandments, he had done everything he could, he was holding on to those things in his heart, and he probably earned them fair and square. The Bible doesn't say how he acquired them. Who knows, maybe he worked for years to gain those things and to save up, get money in his bank account and everything, and Jesus said, well, that's the very thing, unfortunately, that's holding you back from breakthrough in me, because you're valuing that more than you are pressing into me with a reckless abandon, stepping out from the shore because you're too worried about if, if your money bags are going to float when you, walk, when you walk out into the water. The next is unanswered prayers. Anybody in here have an unanswered prayer? Something you've been standing firm in and it's not coming, it's not coming to pass? This can be so incredibly tough to hang on to our face in, the, in, in this time. But it is in these times specifically that we need to war in our worship that we need to push back the enemy in praise. Seasons of silence, where we're pressing in, but God just doesn't seem to be, to be listening. He's not doing things the way we want. Sometimes God is silent because he's tired of hearing what we want to talk about when we pray. So maybe we should think of changing the subject to what he wants to talk about, and then, and then, and then we may hear from him a little more. <laughs> Guilt or shame over your past. Some, some of us just, just, even though we know we're forgiven, we, just, we can't seem to, to really get it. We can't seem to let it go. It still plagues us. We still think about it. It still keeps getting brought back to our minds. I'm telling you, you need to rebuke that, that, that demon spirit that's trying to bring that stuff to you. Because if you're living for the Lord and you've, and you've asked Jesus to come into your heart and be the leader of your life, you no longer have to worry about those sins. The only thing that those mistakes can help you do from this point on 
is to know how, what, what, are your, what are the triggers in your life that, that lead you to do those things so that you can learn from it and grow from it. Amen. But the guilt and the shame and the condemnation that comes with those will do you no good. It can even lead to a false humility. Right. Secret sin. This is a big one. No one in here has it all together. If we had it all together, there wouldn't be a need for a church. Amen. I've heard many people say over the years, even when they were invited by, by myself or people I knew to come to church, they said, yeah, I'm just going through a really hard time. I just want to wait till things settle down before I start turning to the Lord, you know, before I start coming to church. Okay, you know, and, you know, keep pushing, keep pushing. And, you know, surprise, surprise, they never stop in. Because once they do get through that season, okay, now everything's mellowing out. Now I'm, I'm fine to move on. All right, next is unforgiveness. If you're holding an offense against someone, we need to let that go, people of God. We need to let that go. That can be such a deterrent from God's power coming alive in us. Demonic oppression or possession. The enemy can attack us. I've asked the worship team to, to come up here, and while they're, while they're getting set up, I'll just read these last couple of things. If you're feeling any demonic oppression or possession, then you need to renounce whatever opening that is. You need to pray and ask the Lord, what have I done to open myself up to these things that are, that are allowing these attacks to come, the nightmares and, and whatever's going on? We need, to, um, we need to get rid of those things. Maybe you need to call myself or one of the pastors here, call the office and have us, have us come over and help you out with that. Because, because we do not need to be living in that fear. We do not need to be living in that oppression and that, and that madness. Because the Lord is stronger than that. And he has more for us than that. Another thing is lack of fellowship with other believers. Get connected. Get connected in here. You're, you're not going to make it on your own. You're not going to make it on your own. Have someone alongside of you. Someone, uh, try, to, try to find someone whom you respect, who you feel has something going on in the Lord, and uh, confide in them. Con confess your sins to them, knowing that they don't have power to forgive sins, just like any pastor here doesn't have the power in and of ourselves to forgive the sins. Only the Lord forgives the sin. But confessing it gets it out there, like I said before, gets it into the ultimate disinfectant, puts it out into the light, and you're no longer holding on to that. Because in here, there's no judgment. If, if we judged, then phew, shame on us, exactly. Then we can look forward to a harsh judgment if we're judging anyone else in here. Long-term medical problems or afflictions. One of the hardest things to, to get through and to hold on to your faith in when you've been praying for that healing and it's just not coming. So I want us to stand tonight as we close. And if you're waiting through a breakthrough tonight, even in this time of waiting, searching, not finding exactly what you need, I'm, I want to put a call out there for anybody who wants the next level in the Lord, for anyone who wants to step up tonight and go just a little bit deeper in Him. If that's you tonight, I want you to raise your hand. Amen. 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 All right, now let's, uh, with every head bowed and every, eyes, every eye closed, every head bowed, every eye closed, if you feel the Holy Spirit talking on you tonight, if you have not yet allowed the Lord Jesus Christ to be the leader of your life, if you have not asked him to come into your heart tonight, if you're not sure if you left this room, went out to the corner here, get stopped at a red light, and a drunk driver runs through that red light, hits you, hits your car, the paramedics take, their, take a look at you, and you draw your last breath. If you're not sure tonight where you would be after that instant, I want you to lift your hand right now because there is, there is a promise of hope and redemption in Jesus Christ tonight. Thank you. I see those hands. Thank you so much. I see those hands. This is the best decision that you could ever make. We are promised in God's word that he will never leave us or forsake us. That he is more powerful than any problem or stress or conflict that you are facing. He will carry you through whatever it is. But the key is we have to draw closer to him tonight. So, 
as I pray this prayer, and then we'll, then we'll close with the song. As I pray this prayer, I want you, everybody in the room, to repeat after me. And those of you that raised your hand tonight, I want you to mean this with all of your heart. Okay, Heavenly Father, I thank you for your grace tonight. I thank you for sending your Son, Jesus, to die on a cross for me, to take my sins upon himself, and to wash them away in a sea of forgiveness. Now, Lord Jesus, I confess you as my Lord. I ask that you would come into my heart, come into my life, to make me new, to make me whole. I admit that I'm a sinner. I have fallen short of the glory of God and am in desperate need of a Savior. So I thank you, Lord, for saving me, for healing me, writing my name in the Lamb's Book of Life, and allowing me to enter into eternal life. I thank you, Jesus. And I ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a clap tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. All right, now the second, the second part of this that I actually said first. If, if you want to draw closer to the Lord tonight, if you're serious about drawing more from Him, if you're serious about having Him break the current um, capacity that you have to receive from Him and to replace it with a bigger and... and, uh, and um, uh, a vessel that will be able to take more of his presence and his power. I want you to really press in now. We're going to close with this song. It's all about drawing closer to him. If you're praying for something tonight and you need breakthrough, if you're praying for a family member, if you're praying for yourself, whether it be finances, whether it be physical health, whether it be a spiritual issue, if you're stuck in one area, if you, have, uh, if you feel like you're shackled, as, as Rose said earlier, I want you to picture those weights falling off. I want you to picture your finances being deposited, the, the amount of finances that you need being deposited into your bank account. I want you to believe in the God of miracles tonight. He will never leave you or forsake you. And he is bigger than anything that you will face. What the rich young ruler, like we mentioned before, did not realize when the Lord asked him to sell all of his possessions and give them to the poor, what he did not realize is that even that very day, Jesus could have restored everything that he gave away to him. He could have had it being sent right in that very moment when he wasn't even home yet. He could have, it, have whatever it was being mailed to his house as the rich young ruler was giving his stuff to the poor and to those who needed it. Do we believe that in our lives? Are we willing to step out onto the edge, jump off that cliff, not seeing the safety net until we're actually off of the cliff? Are you willing to take that step for Jesus? So let's sing tonight with all of your heart. And I want you to picture that breakthrough happening through the power of Jesus Christ. But it's only going to come tonight through the worship and for you pressing in with everything that you have, not holding back, not worrying about what anyone on the side of you, in front of you or behind you is thinking about you. Just make it business between you and the Lord tonight. Let's sing.
We believe that you are going to be there to lift us out. We are putting our hand out to you. We are seeking after you. We are chasing after you tonight and, and waiting for you to respond. Thank you, Lord, for responding tonight. You're welcome in this place. You're welcome in our hearts. Be exalted, O oh Lord, in our lives. Be exalted, O oh Lord, in our attitudes. Lord God, we invite you into every part of our hearts. We hold nothing back from you. We expose any sin. We expose anything that we wanted to keep secret. We bring it out to you right now in the name of Jesus. We thank you for washing that away, for breaking the chains that that is, that is um, fashioned to us. We are broken in the name of Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Give him a shout of praise tonight. Hallelujah. Okay. It is a school night. It is a school night. So. All right, so let's pray and we'll close. Father God, I thank you for each and every person here, Lord God. I pray that no one missed it tonight, Lord God. I thank you. I thank you right now for your for your amazing presence, Lord, in this room tonight, in the hearts of each and every person right now. Let no one be the same going out from this building as when they walked in tonight. Lord, I pray that you would expand our capacity, Lord God, to receive from you tonight, Lord God. I pray that you are stretching the walls of our hearts, Lord God. And even though there's pain in the stretching, even though there's uh, it feels uncomfortable in the stretching, even, even though um, you're, you're taking that hard file to us, Lord God, we thank you that at the end of this process, we will be able to receive more from you, to hear from you more clearly, to hear you speaking to us. And we thank you for the breakthrough in our lives that we are so eagerly searching for. But most of all, Lord God, in your timing, your will be done, not our will. We seek that you increase and that we decrease. Let our selfish ambitions fall to the side. And Lord, let us chase after you with all that we have for you who hold our tomorrows, for you who have taken care of our yesterdays, and for you who hold us today. We thank you for these things. Get everyone to their destination safely tonight. And may your spirit go with us as we walk out from here to the mission field outside of these doors. Thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Your love is for me. Whoa, 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 whoa.